Hello, I'm Dale Johnson, Artistic Director of Minnesota Opera, and today I have a great pleasure to be sitting down with Dominic Argento uh, to talk about the upcoming opera, The Dream of Valentino, which premieres at the uh, Ordway Center for the Performing Arts on March 1st. Dominic is truly one of the great composers of American opera, certainly of the last decades. Um, he's written wonderful pieces on a diverse amount of subjects, uh, and it's a real pleasure to sit and ask him, um, really, how did we all get here to this point today? So I'd like to welcome and introduce Dominic Argento. Good How to are you, you today? I have my deal. Good to see you. Great to see you. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited about uh, um, The Dream of Valentina. I am too. In a way, I'm looking forward to this as the real premiere because I have a feeling that uh, Eric Simonson, who you've gotten to be the stage director, who seems to know Hollywood, uh, which is, a, for me, the key to the whole thing. The opera is primarily my love letter to Hollywood. and that movie era between the two world wars, the silent movies, all of the great stars. And I always wanted to write an opera about this. Unfortunately, at Kennedy Center, we got a lady from Sweden who was oh. a director, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, which I think had, she had little sympathy or understanding with her. And Eric Simonson, who will be doing it here, yes. if I'm not mistaken, lives in Hollywood. He does live in so, Hollywood, yes. Uh, I, I'm looking for a great result oh, from oh. him. How did how did the idea of Valentino begin with you and Charles? I came up with the idea and Charles just seconded immediately. Uh, I think he would have been happier if we th thought about Sunset Boulevard. Oh! <laughs> of, uh, I, th I still think Boulevard would make great opera. Yeah, I, 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 I've yes. never seen or heard the Andrew Lloyd Webber mm -hmm. version of it, but uh, we agreed about uh, 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 Valentino. What interested me primarily was the idea of his being destroyed at the height of his career. And the manner of his destruction I, has always bothered me. And uh, you may know he was, he died of uh, perforated ulcers nice. and all of that. That was evidently brought on by a wave of scandal. Uh. And the scandal was created by the moguls in Hollywood mm -hmm. who wanted to get him back into the movie business uh, where they could make a lot of money. And they didn't, and there's a line you'll hear in the opera where the mo one of the moguls says to his uh, nephew, says, you know, a, a whiff of uh, a scandal from my nephew's niece. And, we'll get, and of course, uh, what really bothered him was that uh, editorial in the Chicago Tribune. Right. They went after him. Yes. And uh, that, that whole idea that a young man who comes to America and seeks a fortune finds it and then is immediately surrounded by unscrupulous people who destroy right. him. Right. And uh, that, that just made it to me an interesting dramatic arc and in an era, in a, an environment that I just was yeah. dying to use. I, I've always was intrigued with the, uh, uh, the initial idea of uh, Valentino, you know, that we don't really think of as being an artist. Mm -hmm. But he was very interested in his art and being the best he wrote, he wrote a book of poetry. Yeah. Uh, and in, in my score, you may have read, there's a just one page article by H.L. E, uh, Mencken, mm -hmm. who a month before he died, Mencken had invited Valentino to New York. Uh, Valentino had invited Mencken to New York for lunch. Mencken, of course, was the Baltimore Sun. And if Mencken said, I was mystified by the reason for this luncheon because I never saw a movie. I never had heard of Valentino to speak of, except in papers. Uh, he said, but what I realized when I met him was this was truly a, a gentleman hmm. who had been tormented, tortured by these stories that were being leaked about his effeminacy. And right. uh, in those days, that was enough to kill a career. Absolutely. And of course, he was aware of it, and at 31, at the height of his fame, uh, died. Oddly enough, because he was so famous by then, doctors were afraid to operate immediately. Oh, so yes. what happened in stalling, he developed peritonitis, and that, of course, took him away. Right, right. And now then, of course, for me, the, the irony is 
that that made even more money for the people who just joined him. Because right. They made songs like, as they did with, say, with Caruso, God needed the tenor in heaven, so he took unequal away. Right, <laughs> right. Well, he was certainly, uh, you know, one of the greatest stars ever. Yeah. You know, just the effect that he had on... Not on, not only just on women, but on men in the country, yeah. and really the the culture of, oh, of the yeah. country as well. And that, that that most interesting because he wanted to be in real dramas. He came expecting to do plays by there by the great classics in Italy. Right. And of course, what they discovered was that his, with his good looks right. and his sexuality, yeah. he could appeal to thousands. Whereas right. uh, he'll, he'll never he'd never get a chance to play Hamlet. Right, it was so interesting. But you know, when you think about it, he probably could have. He probably could have done yes. it. You know, yeah. Yeah, just untapped talent. Yeah. Well, Dominic. He also, by the oh. way, I, no one knows this, or not no one, but I, I picked up this song. But he made one recording. He oh. sang, uh, what is by the Pale Hands I Love, or one of those old songs. Oh, right. Because he didn't qualify when we started making sound movies. His oh. voice wasn't that good. Somebody suggested maybe singing uh -huh. would help, and <clears throat> he made this one. I don't know if anybody ever bought the record, but there was a record made at one time. Oh, have you ever heard it? No. Oh, I wonder what it's like. He probably was another Caruso. Yeah. But um, go, let's go back to, how did you get into this business? How, how did uh, Dominic Argento become no, one no, of our foremost composers? Well, I always like to use the excuse that, like Mozart or Strauss or Verdi, I married a soprano. Oh, right. <laughs> and, uh, a very good soprano. <laughs> but I, I did, um, even in a conservatory, I was a coach in the opera department, and then uh, we formed a, a little summer stock opera company between my doctorate, uh, uh, master's degree and doctorate. Right. And uh, I learned. Those little contemporary operas, Poor Sailor of Milo, uh -huh. Hinda Zeruka of Hindemith. Right. And I realized I used to be snooty about opera, you know, those odd stories, but not very interesting. And I discovered <laughs> that you really could write to plays and dramas that were as exciting as stage works. Mm -hmm. And that you could do with contemporary music. And mm -hmm. that, that became a turn on after a while. Uh -huh. I, I wrote an opera to finish my master's degree. I wrote an opera during my uh, PhD uh, studies, and I guess about one every every three years. That's uh -huh. my, my cycle like elephants <laughs> Right, right, right. So it just uh, uh, it kind of fell to you naturally then. Um, uh, I call so, yeah. It, yeah. It, uh, I've been very fortunate. I think at least they, they've all gotten premiered. Mm -hmm. I think. I can even say everyone has had at least two performances. That's almost a record. Yeah, really. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I wish I had written one or two more. I think I, when I tallied them up, I would. Uh, but I've stopped writing, as you know mm -hmm. now, because I, my hearing is so un insecure. I, I can't tell for sure if I'm writing what I hear or I hear what I'm writing. What were uh, in the beginning, especially when you were working? Well, in the beginning, yeah. I wanted to be. Actually, a pianist. Mm -hmm. I was going to be one of those pianists who write their own concertos and then play them all over the world, like Rachmaninoff right, right, right. and Chopin. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, when I got to the conservatory, I realized everybody in that place was a better piano player than uh. I was. I better find something else to do. Right. <laughs> and luckily, uh, a gentleman named Nicholas Nabokov, the uh, first cousin actually to Vladimir Nabokov, oh, oh, I, uh, I, I had him for harmony lessons. And, he took an interest. He said, you write very interesting things here. Uh, have you ever composed? And it, luckily he got me started on it. And uh, I, I changed into a composer. My piano playing days were already uh, doomed. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, uh, what were, who were your inspirations? What composers were you really inspired in by? The, in the beginning, it was all contemporary. Ones. I, I must say, and everyone else has pointed it out, that just about, at my point of being uh, influenced, came a, a gentleman named Benjamin Britton. Oh. And uh, my teacher at that time, Hugo Weisskopf, walked me through things like uh, Peter Grimes. And, uh, and that really uh, was an inspiration. But 
behind all of that, the, the inspiration really is Mozart, yeah. Verdi, Strauss, mm -hmm. not Wagner. I don't, I've never warmed to Wagner, but mm -hmm. I can under, I do love Meistersinger. But when we start going underground to, or up to Valhalla, one or the other, <laughs> I, I get a little antsy. <laughs> I have to admit, you know, when I first started hearing your music, the yeah. first opera I, I ever worked on was The Postcard from Morocco uh, in New York, in a small theater in New York. Yeah. And I, I kept thinking... That was the first you saw? That, it was the first I ever worked on. Oh, worked on it. It was a small theater, and we worked on it for like six weeks. And, and uh, I thought it was, was so... I, I was so moved, actually, the, the, of the combination of that melodic writing that I thought was very Italian. Yes. Okay. Um, but then sort of using that sort of beautiful 20th century uh, harmony, you know, centuries yeah. of, of working to that moment. The, that uh, how you could so successfully combine the, that. The influence for that really, uh, uh, I rarely mention his name because nobody knows why, but it's Dalla Piccola. Oh, yeah. Dalla Piccola, uh, if you probably know his opera, they'll put it in the head off. Yeah. Uh, I would study with Dalla Piccola when he was writing that. Oh. And the fact that he could write really lyrical music, and at the same time do it with a 12-tone technique and with mm -hmm. harmonies that only modern composers knew, uh -huh. helped me have enough courage to say, I'd like to try to do that. And right. And I think postcards are a, a case of that. Yeah. But, well, the ability to sort of just uh, take all of these kind of different stylistic ideas and references, but put them together and make a beautiful I mean, masterpiece, and, really. And, yeah. and the, the thing for me that binds it all together is just line. You know, it, mm -hmm. I, I suppose my wife was a, a great influence that way, but I feel that it's simply got to be a line, and that is, that is the glue that holds everything else together. Right. I think as long as there's something either beautifully or well sculpted or interesting in the voice, the orchestra can be doing almost anything it needs. I right. think there are lots of bad things, right. but by, <laughs> by and large, our, our focus is there, and uh, I think our appreciation comes out of the line. So Caroline was was always in, in your mind when you were, oh, yeah. you were hearing things as well. Well, not only on my mind, she was on my piano. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would go away and come back and find that my sketches were annotated. There'd be little, you know, little scribbles on the side saying, don't you think that's too high? Oh, really? Yeah, well, oh, yeah. Oh, I, I have, in that office there, I have a number of scores with all her little uh, suggestions. Where do I breathe? Right. Is it just too long? Right, right. Well, um, Brenda Harris, who's singing June in uh, our production of Valentino, asked me, she said, Dale, you've done quite a bit of Dominic's music. And, and, and I said, just think about think think about the melody, think about the line, you know, and just allow you as as a real bel canto singer mm -hmm. to sing that beautiful line, and in you'll begin to hear sort of all the 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 sort of twenty first century yeah. sounds will begin to all make sense when you put the that vocal line into the middle yeah. of all of that. And because I'd said, well, Dominic, you know, had a soprano for a wife. And <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's interesting to me that that is a point that's overlooked a lot in some of contemporary opera. They, they, the composers sometimes feel that you've got to be as update in writing for the voice as you are in writing for the violins or the symphony. Right. And they, I'm afraid that's not true. There's only one way to write for the voice. The voice wants a line. Right. And you can't tamper with that notion too oh, much that's interesting, without yes. making the whole thing just sort of uninteresting. Yeah, that's what voices do. You know, I mean, they can sort of jump around. They well, can we, do it, but is that really the best use well, of Well, we voice? forget that music didn't begin with that business about Apollo finding a turtle shell and strumming a little bit. <laughs> uh, it right. began in the throat, right. and all the instruments that are sitting in the orchestra today were all meant to be in the original time imitations of the voice. They all want to sing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and the voice just does it better than anybody else has. Yes. Now you've written um, uh, a, a lot of libretos uh, yeah. for yourself. Uh, what, was, what was your collaboration like with Charles? Well, Charles, uh, that, that, we had done an, an opera called The uh, Voyage of Edgar Allan Poe. Right. Brilliant piece. Which, yeah. I thought it was a brilliant libretto, and, and apparently a lot of other people did too. Right. Uh, and when, uh, after Miss Havisham, when I had another collaborator, 
a failure. And so I started writing my own. And Casanova, as you referred to, oh, was yes. the first full length <clears throat> I'd written. And Beverly Sills, who was commissioning it also, co commissioning with Minnesota, yeah. was out here for the premiere. And she sat through Casanova and she came over at the end of that. She said, Don't you ever let anybody else write your libretto. Oh. <laughs> it's I, a brilliant I, I had that in yeah. mind. But when it came to Valentino, and I, had, I had sketched out my own libretto, and I kept thinking, Charles has had experience in Hollywood. Charles was on Broadway. Right. He played Billy Budd on uh, Broadway and, and had a career acting in Hollywood, and he knew that the whole thing. And of course, he's a great opera fan, as you must have known. Right. And I thought, why not take advantage of his mm -hmm. expertise? Because there are, are even expressions like one shot, two shot, you know, I don't even know what they mean. Right, right. But he, he wanted to work some of that vocabulary in. Right. And so um, I did learn. The right. uh, irony is that when we saw it at uh, Kennedy Center, and he was annoyed by the way it was being treated in the production, uh, we never got a chance. I was hoping when you mentioned that uh, with, uh, you would be considering doing it yet, that he, he had just died, so yeah. he was not available, so I had to, in a way, do the revision myself, and it makes it a little more my own, but I, mm -hmm. I, I do appreciate what Charles has done, and yeah. I, I think a lot of people who knew Charles as a playwright would be thrilled to see this yeah. work of his. Well, so it, when you work with a librettist, or would you work with yourself as a librettist? Yes. How? What's the process? Do they write the whole thing, and then you, you know, begin to write f with it, or I, from I will it, never, or? never understand the most popular question I have ever been asked about opera: What comes first, the words or the music? <laughs> right. And if I'm truly very irritable, I'll say, "Oh, well, I write about two and a half hours of music, and then somebody comes along and just takes <laughs> words all over." But when you stop thinking of it that way, you couldn't possibly make a plot out of anything like that, or a, it'd right. be absurd. Yeah. And I think that's a hangover from Broadway, where it's, it's possible to run a right. song and then have Hammerstein come in and do the words or right. Sondheim. But uh, no, uh, the words always come first, and that comes after you've decided on a subject, mm -hmm. and uh, I should talk about that sometime. Yeah. I, I, yeah, no, I, no one ever asked. No, I see. The thing is, I, I think that you know, uh, you know, at some point, I think we got a little astray with forgetting about the story. You know, forgetting right. why why are we even having an opera? Yeah. It's because we have an interesting story to tell. Yeah, and uh, so it's it's fascinating to hear you talk about that because. Uh, the story is is what inspires you, and the story, if skillfully told, mm -hmm. allows you as the composer mm -hmm. to do what you do best. And, yeah? and, and, and carrying on with that point, one of the things I've tried to do most of it is to have a, a libretto that was written in the beginning to be an opera, ah, right. not not as it was know right now. There's a real vogue for taking movies, right? Uh, and that can work, mm -hmm. but you have to shoehorn in opportunities right. for the music. Right. Whereas if the libretto itself is created to be an opera in the first mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. um, you probably know W. H. Auden's comment when he's writing *The Rake's Progress*. Somebody said, "Do you have to uh, minimize your poetry or uh, be careful?" He said. All I do, I think of it as a love letter to the composer, ah, mm, and yeah. that meaning that I want to give them every opportunity, give her right. every opportunity to use their music talent. Right, right. And uh, that's why with Charles, well, these were not adaptations. Uh, Valentino was original, Poe yeah. was original. For me, the ones I wrote, Casanova and Order Bertal were original. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I don't know how other composers may feel differently about mm -hmm. this, that you can take a, a movie, I, I, I don't know, something like Galaxy, I doubt you could take that with two characters, couldn't run it, but, <laughs> but for, for two hours. In 3D. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Um, what was it like uh, moving to Minneapolis and, and being a part of that, that rush 
uh, that we call the Guthrie in the, yeah, the but, beginning. Of course, when I moved here, there wasn't any rush, <laughs> <laughs> except on my part to get out. Right. <laughs> now, when I came here in '58, I really thought it was not going to last very long. I wanted to get east coast, west coast, but. The Walker was letting us do some contemporary concerts in the Unitarian Center, we did. And then in a year or two, Guthrie came and I talked to the people about maybe we could have a small opera performance. We were just going to do Albert Herring, but then we decided that's over our heads. So we would, <laughs> we would do a, a mask of uh, Venus of Donis and now Mask of Angels. And by that time, the Guthrie was up and I was writing music for them and we had an opera company going. And, we had a great orchestra here, chamber orchestra. I, I began to think, what, why, 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 why do I want to leave? When I did have a sabbatical and went to Europe, I met a sculptor in uh, Salzburg. Uh -huh. We spoke English in a great restaurant together, and he said, Ben, where are you from? I said, Minneapolis. He said, ah, oh, the Athens of America. Ah, and interesting. I, I thought he was pulling my leg. And I said, the Athens of America? He said, we read about, you have a St. Paul Orchestra, you have a, a Minneapolis Symphony, you have a Guthrie Theater, you have a superb children's theater, you have an opera company that's uh, sensational. He said, where, where else in America do you have all that? I, <laughs> he was right, yeah. and that's why I'm still here. I think that's why we're all here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. because the, the, uh, it is an extraordinary community. It, it is, and, and I think I've mentioned it in my book several times. The, the, that's, primary reason I'm here. I think the audiences we have here are so unlike the audiences on the East or West Coast where it's part of the show, it's part of the act. The people who come to an opera here come because they love opera right. or go to the Schubert Club or go to the orchestra or whatever. Right. And I think they are genuine lovers of art. Right, right, right. So when, uh, how long does it, how long's the process for you? You know, I, I assume that, you know, it takes probably, what, six months Three. to write a libretto or so, maybe a year to write a libretto. I've already done, I didn't work it out, but I'm pretty sure it's about three years for a full-length opera. Mm -hmm. And right. I, I think I can even, you know, figure that I've been writing for 50 years, if there are 13 operas, if you divide that up, it's ah. not about Yeah, oh, that's interesting. But, uh, of course, I've done other things. The operas are very, very slow and long, and I, yeah. I've always enjoyed that. Uh -huh. it, it sort of gives... A, uh, an arc to the whole year, where I'm writing short pieces, you finish one now, what am I going to do, and there's a, the other one, I've got a job going on. Right, 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 right. Do you, uh, as a composer, well you were a pianist, do you no. think orchestrally, when you're, even when you're writing the, the piano reduction? No, so. I, uh, as a matter of fact, I, the complaints are usually to my, and I make my own vocal scores. Right. Which you may have played many. Yes. And they're the least pianistic thing you'll ever <laughs> Well, I didn't want to say but. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think uh, the, the vocal score of Edgar Allan Poe right. is on four staves, and, and we take a pianist with four hands to do it correctly. Right, right. Well, that's our job, though, I yeah. guess. You know, to <laughs> but, try to figure out <laughs> you know, I, I, what's important. I, I gave up writing for the piano. I, I, I have one little piece in Intermezzo that I wrote as a gift for a friend. Uh -huh. uh, but. It's, it's never, after the original enthusiasm for the piano, it never came back. I, uh -huh. I, I, don't, I don't get moved by the color of the piano. I need an orchestra, uh -huh. or I need a chorus, I need voices. Mm -hmm. but the, the piano, like, like the organ for me, is sort of mono, monochrome. Right. It's very interesting. So you never wrote that piano concerto that you no, were talking about? <laughs> well, I, I did start one in the key of A flat minor, ah, which had all seven flats. I thought, right. I thought it was going to be the most difficult piece even. <laughs> right. I think I did about five measures of that one. <laughs> oh, it's interesting. So uh, are there any other kinds of subjects? You know, we read about Verdi and what Verdi wanted to write. Some of the, uh, you know, Oh, my uh, great unfinished opera. May I take a minute to tell you? Yeah. At the premiere of Valentino in Kennedy Center, the, the whole diplomatic corps was there, mm -hmm. for, and the, uh, Martin Feinstein, the uh, uh, intendant, had Carolyn and me sitting at the table with the Italian ambassador and his wife. Uh -huh. And the Italian ambassador's wife was next to me. She said, Mr. Argento, what are you going to write next? 
And I said, well, what I want to write more than anything else, I've been talking about this for 30 years, but I cannot get the rights to it. And she said, what is that? And I said, well, you would know it is called Il Gato Pardo. Oh, the, my the leopard. goodness, the leopard. And I said, it's a, a fabulous movie with uh, Bert. Bert Lancaster, yeah. And these counties direction. I said, I, I think it would be a great opportunity, but you, why don't you do it? I said, I don't get permission. She said, well, how come? I said, I, I, they, uh, the Lampedusa family will not give it to me. Wow. And she said, Boris, she called across the table, her husband, <laughs> Boris, he wants to do Lampedusa's she said, you know, Boris is Lampe Mrs. Lampedusa's nephew. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> really? But he, and he promised he would ask her. Uh, by then, the, the prince was dead. Right. Uh, uh, and it turned out they had already given the rights to an Italian composer named Mussi, I think. And it had been done and failed at Palermo. Huh. And, uh, but he still has the rights, you know, for 100 years after his death. So. There. That would have been a real epic, I that have would to have say. Been, yeah, that, that, yeah, that would have been, a, I think, just a great opera. Yeah, I think the it's theme, a, a brilliant story. And, and wonderful carriage of Tom Grady. And the, the, yeah, yeah. It'd be, uh, you know, it'd almost be a ring cycle. You know? <laughs> an American ring cycle, or uh, an Italian ring cycle, yeah. I should say, as well. Um, so, so, the leopard uh, is one thing as well. Yeah. Um, did, did you... Did did inspiration for stories come to you, or did you know did did theaters ever come you to know, you and it, say, it, it, "Oh, we want you to do this story"? It, it, a lot has to do with the commission where it comes from. For example, backing up, Valentino, I knew was going to be in Washington, mm -hmm. and I wanted something very American. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, that flaming age, the jazz age, and mm -hmm. Hollywood and all seemed right for that. Uh, audience. Uh, Casanova here, for the opening of the Ordway, I was asked to write a comedy. Mm -hmm. But talk about inspiration there, of course, uh, that was going to be their new home, right. and Casanova uh -huh. the new home, and right. it started the wheels going. So, you know, it, the inspiration or the, the idea can come from a bunch of things. Right. So you just had a, a huge success in Dallas with uh, a new production of the Aspirin Papers. Oh, wonderful. I, I can't believe that I had a premiere 25 years ago uh -huh. that had people like uh, Von Stata uh -huh. and Soderstrom in it, and that they would revive it 25 years later with people like Susan Gray of it. Right. And, and, uh, 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 unbelievable. It was a great production. Yeah. Right. I've heard it's just sensational. So, uh, and actually, uh, since we've been talking about Poe, uh, what was the name of your friend here who called me, the director? Oh, oh. yes, Thaddeus Strasberger. Yes, Thaddeus. Right. He sent me a telegram uh, after the performance of premiere in November, a triumph in Germany, and they've oh. added, it's eight performances now. Uh -huh. they, they've added to it, and it's been getting, he says, fabulous reviews. So. Oh, well, it sounds like right up his uh, alley as well. That's a brilliant piece, I have to say. Um, um, Chicago had a big triumph oh, with it as well, the, the revival the, 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 of it. That was a, Marvelous yeah. production, yeah. Right, 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 right. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of these pieces, Casanova, Aspirin, Valentino, um, uh, Poe, will really all, you know, mm. continue to be performed uh, in the years ahead. And I think it's you a great know, tribute. It's funny, <clears throat> oddly enough, my favorite opera is not among those. What is it? I wonder if you would guess. Is it postcard? Yes. Miss Havisham's Fire. Oh, Miss Havisham! The Fire, oh. not, not the mama drama, but the, the, right, the right. one that was originally written from Beverly Sills. Right. Uh, uh, that was revised too. Uh, right, for in St. Louis. That, that gave me hope about revising uh, Valentino, that you right. could actually make the improvements you wished for. Uh, that, that's, uh, that was, as you know, my biggest failure. That was New York <laughs> City Opera. A terrible place to fall on your face. So, <laughs> yeah, I wish it had been in Tulsa where right. no one would even remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then you were asked then to come back and uh, take a look at it for Jim Robinson in, down in. In the case of, of Havisham, it was 15 years of just sulking and uh, <laughs> just determination to change this and do that. And actually, the, 
but it was revived at uh, St. Louis. St. Louis, yeah. They did a wonderful job. Absolutely, it. it was a fantastic production yeah. as well. So that's your favorite opera, huh? Yeah, it is. Wow. Uh, I, 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 mainly because I, I killed myself writing it because it was going to be Beverly Sills and Julia Friedel's last piece on stage, and she wanted some huge, epic piece. And I put everything into it I knew. I mean, everything in it, including the kitchen sink and a few accessories. <laughs> oh, well, I think it's a terrific piece. I actually worked on Miss Havisham's Wedding Night right, uh, as a monodrama. Uh, I was just the pianist for it. We just mm -hmm. had uh, me out in Colorado playing the piano. <laughs> and uh, it's a wonderful piece, I think, mm -hmm. and a wonderful subject as well. Good, good. Well, um, I think we're just about uh, at the end of our uh, talk with you, Dominic. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what you think about uh, the new production of The Dream of Valentino. And uh, I think we have a good cast and a good-looking production. So Great. Hopefully we can do justice to your work. I look forward to it even more new to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dominic. Thank Great. you, dear.